get started in just a moment, give everyone a chance to come over. looks like we are ready to begin. Hello, everyone. Welcome. I'm just going to go ahead and share my presentation on my screen here. Welcome, everyone. I'm Minerva Delgado, Director of Coalitions and Advocacy at the Alliance to End Hunger. And I do want to welcome you to our plenary today, tackling the racial hunger gap and advancing equity. I'm thrilled to be joined by our distinguished panel. Our presenters today will be Alejandra Gep, Health Programs Director, Training and Engagement, Unidos US, Jan Heyman, Environmental and Natural Resource Director, Osage Nation, Mark Crane, Executive Director, Dream of Detroit, Mark Majors, Director, Employment and Training Programs Division, Minnesota Department of Employment and Economic Development. I hope you'll take time to read their bios in the platform. Um, I'd like to start us with a few definitions. Uh, you can see them here, so I'm not going to read them to you, and you also have the sources for these definitions. I'm defining structural and systemic racism, which terms that I will use interchangeably, uh, just so we're all on the same page, racial equity, food insecurity, uh, and also the racial hunger gap. This may be a term that you're not familiar with. It's a term we've been using at the Alliance to End Hunger, and the term really refers to higher rates of food insecurity which is a household level economic and social condition of limited or, or uncertain access to adequate food uh, among black, indigenous, Latino and people of color in the US due to historic and systemic discrimination. It is this phenomenon that really started the Alliance to End Hunger thinking about hunger as a racial equity issue. And that's been a big focus of our work for the last few years. Um, and I did want to share the most recent statistics on food insecurity. So what you see here is how, um, this graph illustrates the percent of food insecure households by race and ethnicity in 2020. Uh, I want to remind everyone that the largest number of people in the U.S. who are food insecure are white. What we're talking about here is the percent of households within these populations uh, that are food insecure. And when you look at that, which is the rate of food insecurity, we see that the white rate of food insecurity in 2020 was about 7.10. That's the blue line. Um, in we also see that the Hispanic um, food security rate for households was 17.2. For uh, Blacks, it was 21.7. And for Indigenous households, it was approximately 25%. Um, these statistics come from the USDA with the exception of uh, the indigenous statistic, which I've put here for comparison. USDA does not measure um, food, food insecurity in indigenous households. And I, I'm giving you the source of this particular data point. Unfortunately, these relative percentages where you know whites as, as a group have the lowest rate of food insecurity, then usually Latinos are you know, about twice that rate. Uh, blacks are usually twice to three times that rate, and uh, Native households are three to four times that rate. These relative percentages have held pretty much for as long as we've been reporting 
uh, food insecurity. And understanding that we're never going to end hunger until we really start to address the root causes um, and change the paradigm around why these communities have higher rates of food insecurity is what's behind today's session as well as the work we're doing around racial equity in the anti-hunger space. You know, hence the importance of understanding and combating the racial hunger gap. Um, I've said for many years that hunger is a symptom of many, many social problems we have here in the US. And when we're talking about hunger and poverty among communities of color, we have to look at the role systemic racism plays. And I find this infographic from Bread for the World particularly helpful. I know this is difficult to read, which is why we've added this as a document that you can access in the session. So below this viewing window, you will see documents that you can uh, download. And one of them is this Bread, Hunger, Structural Racism infographic, because I do want you to be able to read it. Um, this infographic describes how systemic racism impacts different areas of life and how those uh, can lead to conditions and barriers that contribute to higher rates of hunger and poverty. Um, and so for example, the way you sort of read this chart is, for example, I'm gonna look at the, the over-policing uh, for a second. For example, structural racism leads to over-policing in black and brown communities, which leads to higher rates of incarcer incarceration, uh, loss of income from incarceration, debt from the cost of being incarcerated, as well as higher incidents of loss of life uh, due to, you know, these increased interactions with the police. Um, so that is one example, and all of those things then lead to barriers that maintain higher rates of food insecurity in communities of color. Um, our panelists today are going to share information about what works to address some of these structural inequities. And in doing so, how they are closing these um, racial wealth gaps, racial hunger gaps, and racial poverty gaps. Um, so each panelist is going to uh, provide information on their work. Uh, then we will have and you know and engage in a discussion where uh, hopefully you will be asking questions. Please put your questions in the Q and A, and we'll make sure we get to those. Um, and you know we've asked each panelist to talk about the work that they're doing and how their work addresses some systemic inequities. So we're, I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing. And uh, we'll start with our panelists in alphabetical order. So I'll ask Alejandra to uh, go ahead. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I hope you can see my slides once I start um, sharing. Um, just give me a second. And here you go. And give me a thumbs up if you can see my, my slides uh, well. Great. Excellent. So um, I'm Alejandra Jeb. I work with Unidos US as a health director for um, health programs. And everything Unidos US does is around equity and um, equality. Um, we uh, are the largest Latino civil rights and advocacy organization that for more than 50 years, we have united communities and different groups seeking common ground through collaboration, as well as share a desire to make our country stronger. We have led with courage, tenacity, and, and purpose, and I'm going to explain a little bit uh, later on about that um, we conduct work in, in different areas, research, um, 
advocacy policy analysis and the implementation of pro, uh, programs, culturally relevant uh, programs in, in communities. And one important act, asset that we have to our, to our disposal is our um, network and its close collaboration of community-based uh, community based organizations, almost 300 uh, of them. The, that are delivering uh, critical services in different areas. These organizations are located in 41 states, DC and Puerto Rico, and they have the capacity to reach about 8 million uh, clients um, every year. One important thing to note about uh, Unidos US uh, network, these are independent, um, organization that are housed in different parts of the country, uh, 41 states. I want to dive a little deeper about food insecurity and, and impact on Latinx. Uh, as Minerva explained, Latinos are more likely than the general population to experience food insecurity. and chronic condition. This is in part to the impact of the social determinants of health that affect a wide range of health risk and, and outcomes. Um, Minerva also mentioned these racism, language, education, and cultural barriers create inequalities that make Latino communities more vulnerable to uh, food insecurity. During this very long pandemic, we um, all the um, inequality and, and racism that has long existed has made it uh, even tougher for families to afford healthy food and, and nutrition uh, meals. Uh, food insecurity, no surprisingly, um, arose among a number of communities, including Latinos to almost 20% uh, in 2020. And this is a figure that comes from uh, Feeding America. There are some reports that it rose as high as 47%. Uh, when it comes to system challenges, um, one is NAP, the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, is a federal nutrition program that helps low income individuals and families to put food on the table. Unfortunately, um, there are many Latinos who uh, don't qualify for the program. During the, this pandemic, a major uh, challenge has been navigating it uh, using. Um, in a virtual world, it's not wasn't designed to be to enroll people using virtual technology, and that this has been a major challenge, and we are advocating for that. Um, one prevalent and pervasive uh, challenge uh, individuals and families are confronted with is the limited access uh, to bilingual, bicultural staffing application centers, um, coupled with very scarce outreach and information about the program. And in some communities is the lack of reliable public or private um, uh, transportation. Another major system challenge has to do with the limited access to culturally relevant food and ingredients in food pantries and, and, and uh, food banks. And um, we are working uh, with Feed in America and, and others uh, to bring uh, light to that issue and to make uh, recommendations and improvement. Comprando Riquisano is um, a national program that Unidos US uh, leads where promotores de salud or, or community health, health workers conduct uh, nutrition educational, culturally relevant nutrition education, as well as provide information and enrollment assistance into SNAP. Comprando Riquisano has been super impactful um, due to uh, its comprehensive and culturally responsive model, coupled with UNIDOS US capacity to work with diverse grantees, 
as partners as under one common goal, which is to reduce um, hunger and food insecurities in, in communities. Currently, um, the program I want to mention, the program is funded by Walmart Foundation. Um, and, and it's been in existence for seven years now. Currently, we are working in close collaboration with 27 subgrantees. Of these 27 subgrantees, 22 are providing information and enrollment uh, assistance in, in communities, and the remaining five provide nutrition education and um, SNAP uh, information and, and referral. What you are seeing on, on the screen in um, 2019-2020 grand year, 4.3 million Latinos were rich with nutrition and SNAP information via news and social media. Um, a little over 87,000 Latinos were rich with face-to-face -face nutrition education and, and community events. Certainly, during the, the, the pandemic, this has changed. And over 24,000 eligible Latinos enrolled in, in, in SNAP. So as you can see, um, we are super proud of the program and eternally grateful to Walmart Foundation, who has supported uh, this work. I'm often asked about our best practices to reduce food insecurity, and I have listed a couple of the most relevant ones. Access to cultural, culturally uh, um, appropriate information is key, as well as information about SNAP and other federal nutrition programs. At Unidos US, at the program level, uh, we, we we do the, we do that uh, because we know that SNAP participation is critical to reducing food insecurity. And at the policy level, we um, advocate uh, to eliminate or reduce barriers to to access. Partnering with grassroots organizations is key. We have a network of nearly three hundred community based organizations. Uh, doing extraordinary work and during this pandemic, um, their work, they've been in the front line uh, literally day and night providing services. Um, we also identified culturally relevant health promotion models. I We have extensively used the community health working model, Promotores de Salud. Why is this? Because they help build trust for healthier communities. These are um, local agents of change, individuals who are trained on um, a topic and are part of the communities. And they have the power to um, reach out um, to, to neighbors and, and community members with culturally relevant information. Program sustainability is another one of our best practices. We attempt to replicate these models uh, for building well being and, and health. There are opportunities at the federal and local level to reduce hunger and food insecurity. And Unidos US arm, advocacy and policy arm is, is quite strong. The bottom line is that policymakers must invest in alleviating persisting hunger among Latinx and other communities. For example, in, ensure an equitable and just lens. Um, it's just integral, inter, integrated in all policies or must be integrated in all policies and procedures. And the second bullet I have there is invest in the development of culturally and linguistically appropriate health promotion uh, programs. During this pandemic, I've been reflecting um, about what else can I do to reduce hunger and food insecurity. I'm part of a community of practice and the number one funding, um, finding there in, 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 in the work we've been doing was that 
racism and equalities persist because systems organizations don't make changes. So the question here for us to reflect is, what are we doing today? What are you doing today that can cha change how we impact the lives of Latinx families and other groups in communities tomorrow? For example, we've been hearing for the longest time that food banks, uh, pantries or government offices or national organizations don't have um, the cultural uh, staff, which act as a barrier to access some of the services. So what are you doing today to, to bring a more diverse pool of, of staff if that is the case in, in your organization? And the second and, and, and super important reflection that I practice almost every single day is what you are seeing on the screen. Is your organization intentional in how to serve priority groups? Um, and this is super, um, just I want to leave you with that, to, th to think about that. Um, I'm going to show you about, and, and some you can display the video, a short video that will show you how we have advanced equity through our policy and program. And I think the video depicts well um, our intentionality behind um, um, to tackle uh, and reduce um, uh, or improve opportunities for um, Hispanics in the country. Alejandro, if you stop share, I can share the video. Great, thank you. Hi, this is Minerva. Just want to do a time check. Um, I'm a little concerned that we may not have time for the video now. Okay. Can we can we hold it and see how we're doing towards Absolutely. the end? Absolutely, we can share it in the in the message below as well. Thank you, thank you so much. And Alejandra, thank you for that very powerful presentation. Um, I really love your, your call out about being intentional in terms of serving the communities and making sure that you're bringing those voices into the organizations and institutions that are, that are serving them. Uh, thank you so much. Um, Jan, you're up. Thank you. Thank you for um, the opportunity to be here today. Um, Minerva, I had one quick question. Um, kind of what time, how many, how long do I have? So I make sure that I'm staying close to time. Sure, yeah, you have about 10 minutes. Okay. Um, let me see if I can <laughs> get my screen share. Okay, can you see my screen okay? Yes, it is. Um, if you hit play, play or start from the beginning, it'll show us the presentation mode. We can see it though, it looks great. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Um, Yes, so um, my name is Jan Heyman, and I'm with the Osage Nation Department of Natural Resources, and we are located in Pawhuska, Oklahoma, which is um, the north, kind of the north central part of Oklahoma. Um, our reservation um, butts up to the Kansas state line, so that kind of gives you a little bit of idea where we're at. Um, our reservation is just under a million and a half acres, and I think our um, member... Um, the number of Osage members that live in Osage County, which is our reservation, is it fluctuates a little bit. It's about 5,000 people. So um, within the Department of Natural Resources is includes, we include the environmental and natural resources um, section, um, the harvest land and the butcher house meats. So um, our the Osage Nation farm started about 2014 and it was primarily just outdoor farming and a small aquaponics system. And then when COVID started happening, the Osage Nation received some federal funds under the CARES Act and using those funds, 
our administration wanted to uh, move forward forward with more substantial food sovereignty programs. So that included, um, we developed further on the harvest land, which now includes a 40,000 square foot um, state-of-the-art greenhouse, a 44,000 square foot, what we call a programs building, which includes a large commercial aquaponic system, a commercial kitchen and large freezer space and refrigerator space, a five acre outdoor um, orchard. And then our meat facility is a 19,000 square foot facility and it is state and USDA inspected. So my presentation is mostly just kind of pictures. Um, so you can kind of see what our program looks like and I just kind of talk through it. So it's very informal. Um, the picture um, you can see on this slide, one of the pictures is the development um, of the programs building. Um, it's kind of hard to see from an aerial view, but you can kind of see the scale. So our greenhouse. Um, it doesn't look to me like the slide's been advanced. I'm happy to be wrong, but. It doesn't look like it is advanced? No. That's strange. Maybe if I do it that way. We're seeing um, the whole presentation, but if you're able to click on the left-hand side and share the next slide, then we can see the image. <laughs> oh, click the next. Let me. And the other thing you can do is go from beginning and it will, uh, you, do you start clicking? So then when you're ready, um, you just need to share again because you did stop the share. Oh, I did stop the share. Let's try this again. I'm hoping to click on the right <laughs> screen from beginning. Can you see that? You see your whole presentation again in like your setup mode, but if you click through the left panel of slides, it'll keep bringing up on the big screen each slide. So right now we see That's one, two, three, four, five. I'm not sure why it's doing that. Oh, can you see it now? No, we just see the, the whole PowerPoint. <coughs> Let's switch. <coughs> now we see slide two, slide one. So you can see it? <laughs> yeah, when we saw slide two, when you just opened it, now we're on slide one again. Can you see slide two? No. I don't know what is happening. There we go, now we see slide two. <laughs> well, I, if you can see it, maybe I can just do it this way. Is, right. if you can see. <laughs> there, now we see slide three. That looks okay. great. I'll this just do it this way. Um, so here's um, a slide just showing um, kind of the things that we're doing in the greenhouse. Um, we are doing a variety of um, species, produce species, including some culturally significant species. Um, the bottom left is an Osage specific Kusha squash. We also do Osage specific red corn. It is a uh, Osage uh, variety of corn species. Um, we do um, peppers, tomatoes, other types of squash, zucchini, um, all kinds of things. Here's a picture of our orchard. Um, and it's still, you know, just got planted. So um, we're still early in that process. But we have a variety of um, nut trees. We have um, elderberry plants, persimmon trees, pawpaw trees. Um, one of the, for us here at the Osage Nation, an important part of this whole process is partnerships. So we have really developed um, partnerships with other universities 
And uh, one of those is the University of Missouri. And um, they have provided, um, they helped create the grow plan um, for the orchard and have also provided us pawpaw fruit so we can go ahead and start learning how to prepare the pawpaws and um, once our trees get to be um, providing fruit. Here are some pictures of our aquaponics system. Um, right now we have um, probably a quarter of it planted with um, different kinds of lettuce species. And um, we currently have channel catfish in one of the tanks. There's five tanks with fish or that can hold fish. One of those has channel catfish and we just got um, a batch of tilapia um, in another um, tank. So one of our goals was to try to stay as um, closely to native species as we could. Um, that's why we went with channel catfish originally. And we're trying to get other varieties of native fish, um, but we did go ahead and purchase some tilapia so we could help get the system going. And here's some pictures of some of our outdoor farming. Again, um, tomatoes, okra, corn. It's that's kind of self-explanatory. Um, and the harvesting. Um, these are just some good pictures of different peppers and uh, tomatoes and squash. So right now, our harvests go to the Osage Nation's um, early learning um, facilities, and the nation has an immersion school and it's um pre-k up until i think fifth grade right now so um and elder nutrition so that's where our produce goes right now and then we just started a farmer's market um about um september so we're trying to start getting the produce out to the community so i'd say that's one of the biggest challenges that we're um, trying to develop now is just getting, as we're starting to increase our, um, the pounds of the produce that we're um, growing, making sure that that gets out to the community. Um, our reservation is a food desert and uh, we see a lot of tribal members that have um, issues with transportation. They don't have reliable vehicles or just um, gas money to get to um, our facility. So we're really working closely with our administration and um, also trying to use um, grant funds and looking for those so we can develop um, like a mobile grocery store or something along those lines to get both the produce from the harvest land and the meat from our uh, meat processing center um, to the people. And we want to create that avenue so we're getting it more out into the community and reduce the amount of time people are having to spend on the road to get access um, to the food that we're producing. Here's a picture of some of the, again, some of the produce that we've been working on. And another component to what we're doing is education and outreach is so important. Um, we've started some classes for, um, it's just little fun things um, in this bottom center picture. Um, those are herbs. So we are teaching people how to be creative and how they're bringing some of these things into their home. But more importantly, um, we're trying to get people to come to our facility. Um, we want to develop those relationships and uh, let people know that we are a resource for them and to help them kind of um, connect with us in a more meaningful way. Here's um, a few pictures of our meat processing facility. I didn't want to put too many of those pictures up. They might be a little graphic, <laughs> but um, we are um, set up to um, process um, cattle, bison, and pigs. And that's kind of primarily what we do right now. So on the bison, because it's a culturally significant species, um, we try to use as much of that animal as possible. Um, we, we save the hides. Um, we, we save the, the skulls. Um, we engage with the community to make sure that those resources are used and not just discarded. And then here's just... Um, a few more pictures. Um, I also wanted to mention that when we developed our facility, um, we took the, the numbers from the community and we developed this system to be able to theoretically at top production, be able to offset a significant amount of the 
food needs for our community in both produce and um, meat. So this was developed very much in mind um, of what kind of grand scale, what can we do to have a significant impact to the local community to provide food to our people? Um, and, you know, and, and we live in a food, food desert and as everybody experienced, there were food systems break, breakdowns because of COVID. So it was a chance to do something meaningful, really develop the infrastructure for the Osage Nation, but also really assert um, sovereignty through our food systems to be able to be, and, and we're still working on that, um, on being um, a significant resource to our community members. So um, I, I guess maybe the questions will come later, but that concludes my um, quick presentation of what we're doing here at the Osage Nation. Thank you, Jen. Um, that was wonderful. And it's just so heartening to hear about your food sovereignty efforts, you know, wanting to sort of, you know, have those resources within your within your community, within your nation, uh, so that you can be self-sufficient. Um, thank you so much. And yes, we will take questions later. Uh, now we'll turn it over to Mark Majors. Hi, thanks, Minerva. Screen. Let me know when you can see it. Are you able to see it? Yep, looks great. Okay, great, thanks. Um, hey, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so nice to be here. My name is Mark Majors. I'm the Director of Employment and Training Programs uh, Division over at the Minnesota Department of Employment and Economic Development. Um, we are located in Minnesota. Some real quick, Minnesota. If you don't know about Minnesota, though, we've made international uh, attention last year. Um, is we are a state that's located between the Dakotas, uh, Iowa, and uh, Wisconsin. Our population is approximately about five million people. Um, with that breakdown, and the population is approximately about eighty-two percent white, um, five percent uh, black. 5% um, of uh, Latinx, and then 1% uh, uh, of American Indian. And I tell you that because it's important for you to get the context of where I'm kind of going with this presentation. And just to be clear, yes, we do have running water and, and lights in Minnesota. Um, to kind of talk about, and I just want to go back one thing. Some of our, also in Minnesota, we have some great companies, and I'd, I'd be inappropriate for me not to say it, but General Mills is one of those companies um, that is located in those three M's, uh, Target, Best Buy, and the Mayo Clinic. So some Minnesota systemic challenges around equity. Um, I think you could read this and that's kind of tells the story about where we are. Um, I'll just kind of cut to the chase in the interest of time with some, you know, what are the biggest issues? And I think Minerva, you kind of touched on it a little bit. Um, is actually particularly, you know, um, the relationships between particularly uh, men of color and the police. You know, we have uh, incidents and the killings of Jamar Clark, Philando Castillo, um, Durante Wright, and of course, George Floyd. Um, all of those are kind of in, are horrible incidents that impacted not only the hope, uh, you know, people of color, particularly black men in the state of Minnesota, where they see themselves as kind of progressing um, and what their opportunities are for um, advancing into careers and taking care of their families. Um, we also saw the aftermath of the George uh, Floyd killing, which was a civil unrest, which destroyed hundreds and hundreds of uh, businesses, which um, including grocery stores. Um, which obviously impacted many families and led to situations where people were unable to get food for days. Um, luckily, our stores did kind of come together and create an outdoor space uh, for food distributions, but it was it was very tragic. Um, so we even see, you know, the results of horrible incidents like the George Floyd killing that continue to impact um, food insecurity in our communities. So, as I mentioned, I work for the Minnesota Department of Employment and Economic Development. Um, we are the state's um, economic development agency, the primary. Our goals are to bring forward uh, businesses to the state, 
um, to expand, retain businesses, as well as workforce development, which is the area which and I sit. Our mission is pretty clear, um, and I highlighted the everyone for a very specific reason. Um, in our senior, when our new commissioner came on board, we what is our mission going to be of our agency? And, and we said we want to make sure that we're not just empowering certain groups, but we want to ensure that all Minnesotans can participate in our in economy. And so that was very deliberate um, from from the start of the uh, Tim Walls and Peggy Flanagan administration, um, which was to make sure all Minnesotans can participate in our Minnesota economy. Um, these are our values. And as you can see, there's six of them. I just kind of want to go to the point uh, that Alejandro uh, raised about create inclusion. What we That was such a significant piece. And not only was it creating inclusion in terms of the programming that we did, but to Alejandro's um, point is also our staffing. We wanted to, we are striving to make our staff more diverse um, and even to be more accepting of different groups. It's hard to kind of a social services agency where the staff are not familiar with the, the customers we serve and nor understand what their needs are. And so we've gone through a great deal of uh, DEI training um, internally to bring more awareness about diverse groups that sit in Minnesota. Um, so that our teams could be more understanding, um, compassionate, empathetic to the needs of our customers. So just wanted to kind of highlight that. So um, the Employment and Training Programs Division, which is the program that I actually oversee, um, oversee our portfolio is approximately $200 million of state federal funds, um, oversee almost 300 grants per year, and we serve individuals all the way from youth to seniors. Um, some of our programs do include a partnership between the Minnesota Department of Human Services and our agency, and to provide a SNAP and employment and training program, which we serve about 100 folks um, per year, and our average wage is about 1550 or something like that. Um, we are always looking at ways to advance equity um, and which keeps us busy uh, because it, it keeps us thinking about who are we serving, who do we want to serve, and what is our, our goal, which is to really move families into to move people into family sustainable wage jobs, um, which we hope, of course, will move to, you know, move more towards food security versus insecurity for folks. So as a state, we have taken some steps um, to address the challenges to create workforce equity, um, focus on uh, focus and leadership from the top, structural problems need structural solutions, de develop authentic relationships and engage stakeholders, and adapt and change based upon what we're learning. So from the leadership perspective, as I mentioned, uh, Governor Walt and Lieutenant Governor Flanagan have said from the beginning, the equity was going to be one of the cornerstones of their administration. They've gone so far as to create the One Minnesota um, um, Inclusion Group, um, which is a partner, which is an interagency partnership um, that is geared towards trying to address issues around equity. Um, they've also um, gone so far as to hire a new commissioner, my commissioner, particularly Mr. Steve Groff, uh, Grove. And my deputy commissioner, who you can kind of see over here to the right, um, Deputy Commissioner Warfa, um, and bring him on, as well as myself, as well as the director for um, economic opportunity. And then we've also established for our agency goals, what we call equity goals, which is also known as objectives and key results, which each division in our agency has to have a key objective to actually creating equity in our within our divisions. And this has been not only an incredible journey for us, but it's really opened the eye, a lot of eyes for a lot of my colleagues to really kind of take this focus. So we do this every year. Um, we're on our third year of doing it, and I get transformation already through the um, through the department. So structural solutions change requires resources. So we've invested a great deal into a new office of economic opportunity which actually includes an American Indian liaison position, which was on board um, prior to this, 
but has been enhanced um, over the last three years of the uh, Walls Flanagan administration. In addition, we brought on an assistant commissioner for immigrant and refugee affairs. Again, we have a great assistant commissioner. She does an incredible job of reaching out to both our immigrant and refugee community and creates a space for there more dialogue between our agency and those communities. Third is we developed authentic relationships. I think this was something else I believe Minerva mentioned is really talking to the communities and especially during this last year and a half with COVID. Um, I've personally have engaged in almost 100 community engagement sessions uh, to talk and hear what are the needs of our partners, what are the needs of communities, so that we could actually augment our policies and our procedures so that we can meet people where they are. Um, so this has been a, criti a critical piece of uh, work that we've been doing. And some of the work that I've been doing around adaption and change, we've gone to three phases that we did, which were really key. One is revising our grant making process. Two, enhancing our outreach. Three has been uh, changing our policies and getting community input. Um, what that has led to is, and all that work has been to a focus on actually technical assistance, being more inclusionary, being uh, more transparent about our work, uh, led to us changing a lot of our policies that be quite frank had been burdensome and been very difficult, um, particularly for people to get into some of our training programs. Um, and we've made, I think I made almost a hundred policy changes as a result of COVID. Um, which has opened the door for a lot more folks who haven't had access to our training programs to get access with the hope that obviously they enter into employment and essentially go into family sustainable wages. I want to talk about two of our great partners that I get to work with on a regular basis. Um, one is uh, Ujama Place. Um, they're an organization that's located in St. Paul, Minnesota, Paul, Minnesota. Their focus is actually working with uh, young African-American men um, and older, but primarily young African-American men um, who are re-entering, um, coming home. And their approach is really great. It's a holistic approach. It's creating um, a space where they can talk about, you know, their mental health, what their needs are, um, create supportive services and housing, and also to, also to get them prepped up to enter the workforce. So they're an organization that's been recognized by our legislature um, get direct appropriations um, and on um, every two years to do some incredible work. Um, the second organization I want to talk about we work with has just been doing incredible, amazing work over the last uh, few years, and particularly last year. As you can see, you know they they're a very inclusive organization, particularly focused on youth. They have a strong nutrition program, um, which they served. I think in nineteen in twenty nineteen, they had sixty one sites and they served over two hundred eighty four meals. Um, throughout the state uh, to over 6,000 young people. But well, one thing they did do last year was, was mental is they worked with a, a group of kids who brought a lawsuit against the state of Minnesota around uh, unemployment insurance. And the state of Minnesota had a, a law going back to 1938 that said if you were in high school, that you, even though you contributed to the unemployment insurance uh, bank, that you were not able to draw down on that. As a lot of you know, that youth, a lot of our youth, um, particularly from BIPOC community, actually help support their families. And it's not that they just get you know a little money for to go do whatever youth do, buy video games and other things, um, but they contribute to their household. So when COVID hit last year, the most impacted group by COVID, the law was were youth. And so these youth brought this lawsuit against the state. Um, they won. Oddly enough, they had the full support of not only the governor, but our attorney general, Keith Ellison. Um, and the um, the results were that youth were kind of able, had access to up to 14 to $24 million. So it, youth prize has been great. Um, I just want to, in closing, because I know we're short on time, I just want to thank you for the opportunity to be here. Um, I think work that we're trying to do is to try to get us that space and addressing those structural systematic racism that Minerva talked about. So thank you. 
Thank you, Mark. Um, I love, you know, that line, structural problems need structural solutions. And it's great to see how you all are demonstrating what some of those institutional changes that could be made to make a difference. Um, thank you so much. We're going to turn over to Mark Crane now. Uh, great. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I am, uh, let me just start by saying very grateful uh, to be here um, with you all. Thanks to uh, Minerva and the Alliance on Hunger um, and our mutual partner, Islamic Relief USA, uh, for inviting us to the conversation. Uh, so as Minerva mentioned, my name is Mark Crane. I'm the uh, executive director of an organization called Dream of Detroit, um, which uh, works, as you might guess, in Detroit. Um, DREAM originally stood for, it was an acronym that stood for Detroit Revival Engaging American Muslims. Um, and eight years ago, we looked out uh, at a proud city that was on the verge of the largest municipal bankruptcy in American history. Uh, and in that city, we found one of our most historic Muslim communities in the country, anchored in the Black community, um, floundering in a neighborhood that had seen massive amounts of, uh, of, of vacancies and disinvestment in recent decades. Uh, in 2012, Detroit had, had just released its first strategic land use framework in a century. Um, and this was a 50-year plan that called our neighborhood uh, an ecological innovation zone. Uh, and what that meant was that population loss was so high, according to this plan, um, that it would never subside. Uh, and that over time, uh, they said city services would be discontinued in areas like this. Uh, when they talked about ecological innovation, they listed ideas like, quote unquote, controlled overgrowth. Um, or vacant pools to take uh, rainwater off of the sewage system. Um, you know, with neighbors who had lived in this area for sometimes 60 years, you know, I have some neighbors who've lived here for five generations, you know, with institutions that had invested millions in the neighborhood just in the decade preceding this plan, we really pushed back against the narrative that our neighborhood, you know, had no future. Um, and of course, the backdrop of this was uh, a rapidly gentrifying downtown and midtown area um, Detroit is a, is a relatively large city, we're 140 square miles, but quite often you'll hear folks talk about uh, the seven square miles of downtown and midtown, um, which are the areas that have seen, you know, the most concentrated development in the last decade or so. Um, uh, so our work over the years has brought together folks from across the spectrum um, and has really developed into three program areas. Uh, Mission-wise, we often say we're connecting are combining community organizing with housing and land development to revitalize our neighborhood and, and build a healthy community. Um, and programmatically, that typically breaks down into housing uh, development work, economic development, and community organizing. Um, so those are the three parts of, of our model. Uh, on the housing side, you know, again, our goal is to build a healthy, thriving uh, neighborhood um, in an area that had seen a ton of disinvestment over the years, and not just disinvestment, but really predatory actions by entities like our own city over tax, over assessing people's property taxes, uh, and our county for closing on homes at, at, at rates that hadn't been seen since the Great Depression. Um, from 2011 to 2015, in Detroit, one in four homes were foreclosed on by the county itself uh, because of back property taxes. And so we see that our own government was a really a huge part of sort of hollowing out Detroit's neighborhoods. So our housing work, uh, we gather volunteers often to, uh, to, to uh, prepare these homes for rehab and then work with contractors to bring them back to life. Um, you know, we take homes that look like what you see here on the left and try to make them look like what you see here on the right. Um, we've oftentimes walked into absolute messes that would, that would scare you sometimes. You wonder what happened in this house. Uh, you know, we've seen houses that look like people just walked away one day and never came home. We've seen houses that look like, you know, they've been ran through. Um, and we try to, you know, make those look like something that folks would, would want to move into and, and call a family home. Um, on the economic development side, you know, early on we said that uh, if we're successful with this housing work but don't contribute to the revitalization of our local, you know, sort of would-be Main Street, you know, that will really fall short on creating an environment that's truly desirable, that's walkable, that's really going to draw folks in. Um, and so we focused on what it would look like uh, to, to one, eventually rename what we call Woodrow Wilson Street over here, but number two, to really line it with thriving businesses again, like it was 40 or 50 years ago, um, and like we haven't seen for quite some time. So for us, that's looked like hosting a street fair that's brought out thousands of people. Uh, hosting an entrepreneurship course that's graduated almost 70 folks from our site. 
Um, and then on the organizing front, uh, you know, we had to decide early on that we could continue to raise tens and tens of thousands of private donations to rehab these vacant homes, uh, or we could involve ourselves in the systemic issues that have made our neighborhoods look the way that they do. Uh, and some of that is what I was referencing earlier. And so um, in addition to just doing a bunch of volunteerism um, um, to preserve and bring back our neighborhood, we've also done things like engage with the Coalition for Property Tax Justice. You see us here in the bottom left having an information session both helping folks understand how they can receive an exemption on their property taxes, but also how they can engage themselves in this fight for compensation for everyone who was overtaxed over the years. Um, so uh, again, we do community organizing trainings. Uh, we've uh, facilitated our local block club that's in strong relationship with the, the mayor's uh, district the neighborhood office. Um, and again, we're a member of, of coalitions in the city. So over the years, you know, we've done um, a bit of work. We're actually just now uh, staffing up. So we're excited about this next phase of our work. We've largely been a volunteer driven organization. Um, but at the, at the core of our work has been uh, our desire to provide a mixed income community, right? Uh, of, of course, full, uh, affordable, uh, accessible housing, um, but also that doesn't just create low income housing in an already economically depressed neighborhood. So we're actually creating our community land trust now. We just incorporated recently. We'll start moving some of our parcels into it in short order. Um, as we try to create a vehicle for permanent affordability in our neighborhood. So, you know, our work over the years, again, those major kind of three uh, areas of housing, economic development, uh, and community organizing. And we've always sort of worked at this nexus of um, uh, uh, community organizing and racial justice work, right? And so we've been a part of uh, coalitions across the city, like the Detroit Equity Action Lab, bringing together organizations that are um, uh, challenging structural racism in the city of Detroit and in our suburban areas. Um, now, when it comes to, to food access or when it comes to the values of our work in general, we sometimes refer to this quote from the Prophet Muhammad. We consider ourselves a faith-inspired organization, not faith-based. Uh, as Mark shared, in inclusivity is also one of our organizational values. But we sometimes refer to this quote um, from the Prophet, which is a very sort of basic description of a set of uh, of human rights, in which he says, there's no right for the child of Adam except in these things, a house in which to live, a garment to cover his nakedness, and a piece of bread and water. And so, of course, for us, the housing work is, is an essential part of what we do. But this quote also speaks to the centrality of having basic access to food and water as a human right. Um, so in our neighborhood, uh, one of the, the features, if you will, is an urban garden. We call it the Huda Urban Garden. Uh, it actually launched um, uh, in partnership with the Huda Clinic, which is a local free clinic. Uh, and quite often, the things that get grown in the garden are actually natural remedies to the ailments that we're seeing most frequently um, uh, at the clinic. Um, but this this uh, this photo, and I'll start to kind of get toward the end here, is really emblematic of the food justice movement uh, in Detroit in general, right? And sometimes you'll hear us say, uh, Detroit hustles harder. That's a quote that you might hear about Detroit. And the fact is we hustle because we have to. Um, we hustle because Detroit is a city that had its municipal infrastructure hollowed out and where people had to make do. We boarded up 40 vacant homes in our, in our neighborhood, not because we wanted to, but because we had to as the residents living here, right? Um, and so just again, to close out with some statistics about food in Detroit, uh, 30,000 people do not have access to a full line grocery in Detroit. Practically my entire childhood or life at this point, Detroit was without a major supermarket. Only in the last couple of years have we seen some national chains reestablish themselves in Detroit. 48% of our households are food insecure. And this goes with 40% of our households being housing insecure, right? And so there are com uh, compiled, um, uh, excuse me, compounding problems here. Um, and 48% of WIC stores in the city of Detroit are actually liquor stores, right? So. Uh, 30,000 people in our city live in a food desert. Um, uh, almost 20% of the area of our city is, is within the confines of a food desert. Um, and we know that the aid that people are getting is only allowing them access to things like liquor stores and dollar stores, which are just becoming more and more prevalent. So um, we try to contribute holistically to this issue, working with local partners. Um, food policy, food access is not one of our core issues, but we understand these issues holistically. And again, we're happy to be in this conversation with you all today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mark. And uh, thank you to all of our presenters. I'm just astounded at the amazing work you all are doing to take back your community in Detroit. And I think it speaks to uh, the community really sort of just re, um, 
reinvesting in itself and saying, no, we're not just going to go away and you can't just write us off the map. Uh, and so it's just very, very inspiring. Unfortunately, we are out of time. Um, we did put the Unidos uh, US video in your chat and it's also part of your documents. Please take a look at it. Um, I just wanna, if you go, if all our presenters can get back on camera, just wanna thank you uh, for your time. And uh, for right now, we'll turn it over to Sam to say goodbye and help people go to their next session. Great, thank you to all of our panelists. That's inspiring information. You now have your choice between four workshops. To access the workshop, go to the navigation bar to the left of your screen, click workshops, and choose from one of the four sessions and click enter to join. Thank you again to all of our panelists. Have a great day, everyone.